All right, we can get started here. Before I demo your exploratory circuit labs this week, so by design, your lab homework is not computational. I will, I think you have to multiply two things once or twice um, uh, to, to give an answer. But mostly it's configure a circuit, observe a pattern with graphs that are provided in the simulation, as we'll see, uh, and then put some stuff in the boxes, turn it in. So you can, I would recommend getting on the test early this week. That way you have questions by Wednesday uh, that are resolved. Um, shouldn't be really any surprises. Um, it's fundamentally going to be a circuit like the ones you've seen. And there you go. So um, before we do that, though, I do want to uh, alert you to um, some kind of cutting edge, bleeding edge uh, research uh, in these things called uh, MIM. You fill in the blank with either resistor, capacitor, or now inductors. And so these things were theorized uh, during my childhood, 70s, I think, if I remember right, uh, uh, Chua or Cho, uh, probably Cho. This is uh, spelled C-H-U-A, but it's probably not said Chua or whatever. Um, forgot to look that up. And then evidence of them have obtained this century during your lifetime. And what is it? Um, well, if you click on the uh, scientific applications of this stuff in the folder in Blackboard, it'll say uh, in nanoscale devices, these MEM circuit elements, so think resistor, inductor, capacitor, those are our three main ones, but now there's a MEM version. They can store data without power. So useful stuff already in use for certain things and fundamentally like stuff, uh, car speakers and, um, and something else I can't think of at the moment. So this is stuff that, especially y'all who get into electrical engineering, computer science, um, lots of things, this is going to, this is and will continue to be an issue. In fact, there's even, and we'll see at the end of this paper, I think, there's a periodic table of circuit elements. Uh, it's not quite as complicated as the other one, but it, it exists and has for more longer than you've been alive. So um, this is a, a more technical paper. Uh, I'm going to show another one by this uh, Leon Chow. I'm going to say Chow. I'll print it that way. So 1971. Uh, so here's a derivative, some integrals. These are all things within your current grasp of mathematics. Um, nothing new except this V is a flux. It's uh, not voltage or speed or anything. L is for inductance, and that's a, those are currents. It gives some descriptions here, some more complicated graphs that are connecting uh, flux, inductance, current flow. And look at these functions. These are things right out of your textbook. Initial current, sine omega t. So the physics you're learning is absolutely fundamental and pretty much most of the game in this bleeding edge stuff. So you knowing this stuff from physics semester two, and if you're taking the circuits courses in engineering, all that stuff is like on the money. Um, it's up a notch in terms of how complicated these graphical representations are and the number of things you're paying attention to. But look, this, these are not complicated mathematical functions. This is not difficult calculus, not even close. OK, uh, we're just now getting into flux and whatnot in the lecture material and textbook. But flux is just how much stuff goes through a space. So like if you had a hula hoop and you threw tennis balls through it, there'd be a flux of tennis balls, that sort of thing. How much of a field is passing through a plane perpendicular to the plane? Um, more math, all uh, Calc 1 level stuff, quite honestly. Um, interesting choice of term is parasitic, resi parasitic resistance. So resistors kind of gobble up 
uh, a flux uh, issue. And so they, they're, how do we uh, minimize, control that, leverage that? Those are things that they're working on. Um, and so here you can see this is an inductor. It even looks like our simulation. These are magnets, and this is how they were testing them. Um, some field diagrams. So this is all, you know, stuff that you can read and understand much of uh, this article uh, and directly see uh, you're, you're putting your hands on these things either in simulation or if you're in the other course. Uh, I think that's largely simulated too. So I wanted to get to the end here because it's kind of cool. Apologize for the uh, blurriness there. Also uh, testing this toy out. So I'm uh, one of the things about the Blackboard download is that when you download it, it doesn't have the talking head video. So I'm just testing this new screen out. But this uh, this is the periodic table of circuit elements. Uh, kind of an interesting thing is uh, just resistors, capacitors, inductors. And there's this uh, family, so there's a lot to read about that. That totally not testable. This is kind of enrichment. What is? How does the stuff we're doing apply to what you're in this game for in the first place? And I like to, as much as possible, point you at what's down the road uh, for many of you. Now, this paper here by the person who came up with all this stuff initially. And some other folks, uh, I believe if you're engineers, electrical engineers, you're going to be part of that puzzle. But look right here. These things are defined mathematically. So this M of Q being a charge is the, um, the um, MIM whatever uh, in general, the mimosity, I'll call it. It probably has a better word than that. But they're defined, and these are just trivial uh, differentials, differential equations, trivial ones, simple integrals. Right here, <laughs> uh, standard wave equation stuff. Uh, an integral of that, not, not complicated stuff. Here's a current equation, which, you know, is just a, a sum of simple sinusoidal functions. Um, all of this stuff, well, within your, your grasp. Um, pinched hysteresis, we don't cover hysteresis in this course because it's just uh, beyond what's required for an introductory physics course. You would, uh, it is a, something typically your first encounter with that will be in the context of um, motors and generators. Um, it's just not in this course because it's, it's already too many things in these courses. But you can see a MIM inductor, MIM capacitor. And again, these are things, these are regular circuit elements that have a memory that can be leveraged. It can actually, uh, so it's a physical property, if you will, uh, relative to the flux, magnetic flux that would go through them. Again, you know, it's a long, ugly fractional equation, but it's trivial. This is trivial math. It's a tedious math, but it's trivial math. Uh, all stuff you'd just put into uh, some sort of coding environment and it would crunch it out for you. You obviously wouldn't do this by hand, uh, but you might have to write it down. Um, you certainly would have to encode for it in a thing. So all this stuff, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, look simple uh, differential equations here. And this is a nice thing is in reality, what will happen is you'll end up writing stuff like this and then you type it in to a coding environment and whoop, computers do stuff for you. All right, so just wanted to point at that. Uh, also in the folder that I got these out of, and it's a MIM circuit element folder. So it's the top one now in that scientific applications. There's actually a 30 minute video and I for it might be by uh, Leon Chow. I can't, can't remember if it's him or someone else. Um, and them explaining that uh, just so if you're interested, go take a look and you will be on the path. All right, so uh, to quickly go over this lab or to kind of demo it, so you have two exploratory labs. You have an RC 
lab, a resistance capacitive lab, and then LR lab inductive uh, or RL lab uh, resistive inductive. So you have RC circuits, RL circuits, and RLC circuits. Um, uh, we, I don't think we have a lab on RLC circuits, um, but well, probably should build one, but I just kept it separate to keep it simple. I will show an RLC circuit. We'll modify one of these to, um, to do that, but not particularly complicated uh, thing to do here. Um, we're going to go through some uh, configurations. Also, these are old. Uh, I had forgotten that these got updated. Um, and so I, I'm going to have to go in and redo the pictures. So it's still the same basic looking circuit elements, just updated to be prettier, kind of like any software does. So nothing really particularly new. You'll download this Word document and actually put your answers in these boxes, which will either be text or sometimes a screenshot of, say, the graphs that you're going to let run on screen. And these are just kind of qualitative questions uh, or maybe grab a value that's given, but no, no math to do, nothing like the graphical analysis stuff. Just build it, observe it, say something, move on. And it's a long one. I mean, there's 30, you know, 41 questions, but it's just, they're all little bitty trivial um, uh, observational questions that you configure and reconfigure and ask basic questions. And then when we come back to do a more robust uh, quantitative lab, you have all that stuff um, uh, under the belt. So what I want to do is uh, make sure you use the link that's a, outside of the document. I didn't change the link on the inside. Probably won't. I don't know if it'll take you to this or not or to anything. So um, let us um, I'm going to build this circuit here and kind of show more at once uh, than the rest. Let's see here. I'm going to kind of build a, a little bit uh, slightly differently. You can copy me or exactly the thing uh, if you want. But this will suit my needs for uh, outlining the big ideas here. So, you know, not super complicated to uh, build unless you have a terrible mouse that doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, give myself more space up here. This is the boring part. Um, what was my yes capacitor resistor? Actually, what I want to do is pay attention to all of the current flow changes. I'm going to use a light instead of a resistor just because it's more interesting. You can use a light if you want to because it's just it's just a more interesting resistor. Or you can uh, st stick with the resistor if you want uh, when you go and build it. But let's... All right.
the boring part. So what I haven't discussed is why uh, all of these loops, and I think that will become clear in a second. Also, the way that it's configured in the, um, which should be fundamentally the same here, I'm going to get things out of the way of the graphs we're going to have. Uh, you can, in fact, this should work too. This should burn it up. There you go. So don't, you know, it's possible to do that. Um, some basics, you can discharge capacitors, inductors by clicking on them and clicking the little lightning bolt doodad. Uh, and sometimes you need to do that to get things back to uh, the basics of uh, what was going on there. So now I'm going to um, get some data uh, going here. And you if, you, if I click on current, it has a wire that goes over that. If I click on voltage, it uh, opens them up there. And I'm going to, since these are identical loops, I'm just going to pay attention to voltage and current on each uh, one separately. So the top one will do the capacitor, the bottom one will do uh, that one. I'm going to bump this to 10 because I like the way it splits things up when you do that. And so we have this RC circuit. So a resistive, meaning this light bulb acting as a resistor at 10 ohms, a capacitive circuit, 0.10 farads, um, or I guess that would be uh, 100 microfarads or something like that. And we have this circuit, yay. And these um, oscopes, if you will. So if you're in the circuits class, you have a, I think, virtual oscilloscopes, which will give you various kinds of curves and whatnot. These are going to give us a classic uh, uh, growth and decay curves, like you'll see in the textbook for capacitors. Um, they have a, an exponential function, e to some power, or 1 minus e to that power, that defines how they uh, behave. And it's amazing how many things those growth and decay functions apply to. Uh, radioactive decay, electrical transients, uh, uh, epidemiology, to, uh, infectious diseases uh, are used. They use those equations as well. Uh, uh, modeling the dynamics of uh, airflow in a room or any chamber, uh, all fundamentally the same. So when you, that's a cool thing about your craft, you're going to take some courses and in that course, you're going to learn this mathematical tool applied to something specific in your craft. And then you're going to find out that it also applies to the chemical engineers, to the atmospheric chemists and physicists, to the epidemiologists, which means you have an ability to interact with on a meaningful level, lots of other experts. It doesn't make you an expert in their field, but it means that you can uh, grasp what they're saying and uh, not screwed up. All right, so here's, let's run it. So we'll uh, close that thing and you see uh, uh, these transients going here. So you might have to adjust your, your view here. And so we see uh, this pattern here, everything's going slower than it was in my office. It always does that, I guess. So let's just, we can pause it. So there's this play pause button down at the bottom. So this might be a place where you need to grab a screenshot of a graph and put it into the box in Word. Um, not going to go through each one of those questions because that's the whole point of an exploratory lab is for you to explore and try to answer those questions, uh, which means I have to grade harder since it's I can't automate that I have to well, actually have to 
read those things more closely than uh, many of your assignments because uh, they're automatically graded. So here we see these voltage occurs. So we see an increase. I want to look at the top um, uh, parts of the graph here, up here on the um, for the capacitor. Uh, and then so look at the voltage on the capacitor. It's slowly increasing. That's a, an E to the something uh, sort of thing. And there's a, a time constant here that if we were to multiply um, oh, what is the time constant in a capacitor? It's um, it's RC, and I think it's uh, one over that, but I, I forget um, uh, off the top of my head. But you can compute it based on the quantities that are present in the circuit in physical devices. And so what's happening in a time constant, and it, this is true of all physical phenomena, that can be modeled with that type of equation. Um, every time constant, whatever it is, and it's computed slightly differently in each case, but fundamentally there's always this piece of solving that exponential equation uh, where you can factor that out, uh, is in that time constant, roughly 63% of the change happens. So it could be 63% of the voltage buildup, the current decay, the gas buildup, the gas removal, you name it. Um, and then in the next time constant, 63% of what remains to be built up or decayed away. And then in the next time constant, 63 more percent of what remains. So eventually within usually six or so time constants, you've you're at 99.99%, okay? So depending on the rate, you know, we're talking six to 10 time constants, it's over. It may be still building up or decaying out at the six or eighth the decimal place, but we're basically at 100% or down to 0%, all right? So that's the way these things work. And once you master them in one area, the same exact thinking applies in the next uh, area, all right? So notice that uh, in the capacitor, it slowly builds up to this voltage, which appears to be heading towards 10 volts. And we could um, you know, verify that since this one's going to be behaving the same. OK, so it's heading up to 10 volts. Uh, the voltage on the light bulb instantly spiked to 10 volts and then slowly decreases. OK, so there's a, a parity here uh, between these two things. And if you think about and so that's one of the things to notice. And in fact, I would highly recommend that you answer questions not asked. Like this one right here, you know, I am making an observation and then let's try to make sense of it. Why would the voltage build up slowly in a capacitor to the max voltage versus in the resistor, and in this case, the light element that we can see, which is why it shows light bulbs, it instantly spikes to 10 and then decays away. Why would it do that? Well, current is flowing. And initially, there was no charge on the capacitor, but current keeps flowing to it, which it accumulates charge, actually accumulates negative charge on one plate because it's pulling it off the other plate and coming back around, which exposes those atomic cores to make that a positive plate, and you have an electric field set up uh, between them that grows. So like if I let this go a little bit more, you can see that it's increasing to 10 which makes sense. We've already covered that in a parallel circuit, every parallel branch will be at 10 volts. So, okay. And so um, if we were to come over here, notice that the that whole branch is at 10. And obviously as this light bulb goes out, it has less and less voltage. In fact, let's do this. 
of course you can see it on the graph, but this multimeter. So as the capacitor goes to 10, the light bulb is going to zero volts and the current accordingly is going down to zero. All right. And that will go on and on and on and on. And it will slowly, the current, the total current in the circuit will go to zero. It'll be the sum of these two necessarily. So, um, and you can see the long run. What I wish is that these voltage uh, things were bigger or you could scroll around in them and get the whole curve, but uh, that's not the way they work. So they're flattening out. Everything's going to zero or 10. The current is heading to zero because there's no more reason for it to move. We're down to millivolt. Uh, no light lights up at that low a voltage that I know of. I'm sure we somebody could make one. And there you go. And you're, everything's at zero amps, no currents moving, and the voltage, now the capacitor has gobbled up all the voltage because all of the charge that could be moved in the circuit has moved to it. And now it's, it's done. It's capacity is, is constant. So before you, so that's how we charged up those capacitors and we could see uh, this RC connection. So if I open this up, because if I open, if I shut the other one, well, that's closed. It's going to burn everything up. Now I can discharge. So one way to discharge a capacitor is with the magic button we have in the simulation. And I don't know that there's such a thing in reality. You would have a, some sort of circuit pathway to discharge it. So where is it going to discharge to? Well, notice that I've taken the battery out of the loop. Okay. So this is really important. This is going back now to the very first introduction that we had in whatever chapter uh, in my book um, deals with the motion of current, 13 or 15 or something like that, uh, I'm forgetting, where there's a mobile electron C in the conductors, the wires, if you will. And when you put a voltage on it, then that whole electron C, the Drude model, it all gets moving. So the current that's moving in the circuit uh, it moves because that loop is now at a voltage and all of those trons start moving. So we want to think the battery is pushing them out. Eh, the battery is providing a voltage that causes current to flow through it, as opposed to it spewing electrons out under pressure. We use that metaphor because it's an easy way to um, imagine what's going on but it's not exactly not entirely true it's mostly true like uh, princess bread all right so now i'm going to discharge this you can see the light bulbs light up you can see some voltages changing as the current and interestingly here look at the voltage plus and minus so it's conserving uh, energy in that regard, one's an up, one's a down. Okay. Um, now, if we wanted to, we could change our um, the way we read it, and then it would be the same. All right. So that's a, a feature of a circuit analysis that is practically important. Um, for us, not as much as it would be. And you can see now these graphs, if we could scroll back and look at the first graphs, we could see, okay, these are the opposite. Huh, imagine that, that discharging would be the opposite of charging. So that's why it would have paid, you know, back on the last one, get a screenshot of those curves, paste it somewhere, get a screenshot of this and go, oh, okay, pattern. It's like it, like it flipped about the, uh, uh, the x-axis across the zero line. Um, so let that run some more and it's just going to go back to zero eventually. So I am going to pull those out, uh, clear up that screen a little bit. And now I'm going to, um, 
let's discharge this capacitor. Didn't have to do. I'm going to take this one out. So this isn't something that you get asked to do, but I'm going to make this an RLC circuit. And so uh, this, what we were doing was an RC circuit because it had a resistor, light bulb, and a capacitor. Then you will have a resistor and an inductor. Uh, so in the same app, you would pull an inductor out. I'm going to kind of blend that and have an RLC circuit. So I have an RC branch and an RL branch that makes this an RLC circuit. We could have made a single loop where we had a resistor, capacitor, inductor, and whatnot. The other switch that we'll do later is this will become an AC power source instead of DC. And let's do this here. I'm going to um, not pay attention to the light bulb here. And so now we're going to watch voltage and current through the main events here, which are inductors and capacitors, at least for this lab. And I think everything is, so let's let them rip. And so you see, again, every, it's still 10 volt. Um, we pause here. So interesting, current's going to flow differently. Even though the resistors are the same, we don't have the same current flow happening here. And so I'm going to pull up uh, something here. There is an important idea in this thing, and it's there's something um, uh, resistance is resistors, capacitors, and inductors have something in common with one another that we call impedance, meaning they all resist a current flow to some degree, okay? And, but they resist current flow for different reasons. And so um, I do address that in the textbook and not every university physics textbook goes deep on it. So I sort of, um, there's some variance in the way uh, that this is taught usually. Um, here we go. So they're inductive and capacitive impedance. And so uh, for, and reactants, I guess we could, we, there's another word for it. So there is a, a reactance. So capacitors have a certain kind of reactance because that's what they do. They react to an electric field. An inductor reacts uh, to an electric field. It ends up producing a magnetic one too. Um, and so there's a reactance. And so the reactance of inductors and capacitors will get added to resistance and you'll have an overall impedance. Okay, so most of what we do in this course is focused on resistive loads and we, all of our major circuit analysis uh, is about resistive loads. Ohm's law stuff, Kirchhoff's laws on resistors. And that's because this is introductory to the topic and it's enough to cover the physics of it. But in reality, you're going to pay attention to um, impedance because impedance accounts for all of the reactants in a circuit all right and so uh, here in uh, i guess chapter 17 uh, we have reactants inductive reactants uh, is a simple product related to the uh, frequency and this all plays out into squiggly graphs and and all this stuff phase shifting so it can get a little complicated. So here's a, an RLC circuit, all right? Simple as it can be. You could build those and play with them, governed by these equations. So we keep using and reusing this. Um, I did something unusual in this uh, textbook is your circuit analysis chapter is literally 100% examples because there's really nothing more to say. 
there's something to solve now. And I also did not go off the deep end with it. This is the easy, this is a kid version. You'll do much more advanced. You, have, you can have a whole course in AC circuit analysis. Okay, probably multiple courses. And so um, anyway, so you'll have plenty of things that you can uh, look at in that regard. So I just wanted to mention that because we need something, you know, this resistor stuff is easy all by itself, capacitors, capacitance, inductance, inductance, but how do you account for the difference in current flow when there's the exact same resistor? Well, that's because these things are behaving differently. They are reacting differently, which is unsurprising given that they're different uh, devices with different physical properties, different reactions to a field effect. Okay, so all of the textbooks are trying to say that. Uh, mine is trying to say that. The OpenStax one, you name the textbook, they're all trying to say that in roughly the same way and how well they do that. It's up to the reader. How well any professors like myself do that is up to the listener, the hearer. All right, so we can let that rip a little bit longer. Same, the curves look the same fundamentally. Uh, but now voltage is building up in a capacitor as we're charging, but it is another instantaneous. So the inductor behaved more like the light, the resistive load in this case. So these, again, these are just observations. Uh, maybe they're ones that you need to answer again in the lab as it's uh, structured. Um, and then notice how current, now look on horizontally, the voltage of the capacitor versus its current transient. So a slow buildup of voltage, but an instantaneous, instantaneous, uh, still took some amount of time, and then a, a decay. So, and then likewise the opposite for this inductor, an instant voltage bump that starts to decay immediately versus a current buildup. Okay, so why are these things this way? Well, go read about it, take your notes, et cetera, et cetera. And then this will have the same boring result if we wait long enough, you know, it'll flatten out. All of these will go to zero or to some other max value in the transient. So there's always a circuit transient. We ignore at the introductory level, most of them, because they're not important to the physics of this introductory topic. We just, we're not trying to turn you into circuit analysis gurus. Like this is one of the most useful and simple ways to demonstrate the idea of electric and magnetic fields and how that influences current flow. And then if you can understand currents, you can understand lots of things and get paid good money. And that's a, another important thing in life. Um, and so it looks like things have evened out. Notice that in the inductive branch, keeps flowing, lights on, but the capacitive branch, nothing's happening. Because technically you can't flow current through the plates of the capacitor. I suppose if you put enough charge on there, that would spark and Maybe it'd melt and then you have a wire, but uh, that's not even there. So again, we could open that up and then discharge this. Notice how it's already uh, discharging, at least through the capacitor one, and it's also letting this one discharge here. And I didn't even shut the discharge loop that we were using when it was pure capacitive. But I could let it uh, leak around there too and notice the difference. Uh, and can, you can't even see it's such a low amperage, you can't even see things moving in the simulation anymore. So anyways, so that's, you know, build it, however it, the picture says to build it. Feel free to squish it around so that you, if, you know, you can easily see uh, the graphs here. Um, so you'll have, I think, a total of like three different, maybe four, circuits to configure. Usually here's a series thing, here's a parallel thing. And uh, 
I don't think I ask you to do an RLC. I ask you to do an RC analysis and an RL analysis. I've sort of done that and a little bit more for the sake of um, a more interesting lecture. So the interesting, if, so going back to what we started with, it's kind of weird in a, in a nanoscale device, so things that you cannot see with your eyeball. Well, a human hair is uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 microns wide. And so we're talking what I guess that would be uh, 0.1 uh, nanometers to half of that, 0.05 nanometers. Um, and you can see a human hair, but very quickly after that width, you, your eyeball can't see uh, things that small anymore. So you get down to the nano scale, and, uh, you know, somewhere less than probably uh, 20, 10 microns. It's on a nano scale that you cannot see with your eyeball anymore. Uh, one of the things we know about nano materials and whatnot is they behave weirdly. They do not, uh, they're weird. And they're, we're still trying to figure it out. By the way, stained glass windows, the people who invented that back in the Middle Ages or whenever that started, they didn't know they were making nano paint. But that's why they have those particular colors is the, the way that they built made that stuff. They ended up creating a nano material. Uh, so that's like one of the earliest uh, examples of that. But this, these things can be resistors, inductors, and capacitors can be MIM versions of themselves uh, with some really unique properties that um, are kind of cool. You can store data without any power using these sorts of nanoscale devices. And I suppose that, well, they're already at work in various devices and there's more to come as engineers make up stuff and sell it and get paid lots of money. All right, so that's that. I will end the lecture here.